what are systolic arrays how are they implemented how are they designed how do we analyze the structure of uh, systolic arrays right i mean what can we understand about it that's basically what i'm planning to cover over here having said that i'm you know this is a topic on which multiple books have been written multiple phd theses have been uh, you know uh, written on the topic of systolic array analysis and design itself clearly what i can do is just a very superficial summary within the uh, time that we have and the reason why i am not going to go into too much more detail is also because you know these are not uh, although there are some fundamental concepts over here many of them are building on concepts that we have already discussed in the class right and at some level uh, ultimately what it comes down to is this is an interesting idea a concept that you need to know in case you need to implement in case you know the problem that you are dealing with Uh, satisfy certain properties and is basically suitable for a systolic array kind of architecture okay the primary references that i will be using throughout today's uh, uh, lecture and in fact you know most of the uh, pictures are straight away you know, borrowed from there right uh, are uh, by hd com uh, article why systolic arrays which was in the computer magazine in 1982 and the textbook by keshav parhi vlsi digital signal processing which is you know a 1999 book so lysenson and kung were the people who pretty much first brought in this concept of systolic arrays in the late 70s and the article that i'm referring over here right the 1982 article is a very nice clearly written sort of you know a motivation as well as a survey basically saying what are the conditions under which you can use systolic arrays what are the different kinds of arrays that you can create from a given architecture and so on Right, so good reference in other words. Parhi's book, of course, has a more sort of uh, textbook uh, treatment of the topic. That's also a good reference that you can go through. So, what we are going to do now is basically look at this question: Why systolic arrays? Right. I mean, and this is straight away you know, from that article of the same name. Right. and you can clearly see that this is 1982 because you know he is talking about a situation where the memory bandwidth is basically 100 megabytes per second right uh, or rather no 10 megabytes per second right not 100 megabytes per second 10 megabytes per second right and uh, essentially the article pretty much says 10 megabytes per second which is a fast architecture for the time okay and uh, today we comfortably have you know dram bandwidths which are in, probably in the range of 10 gigabytes per second right so a factor of 1000 or so we have increased since then but the point is the basic concepts pretty much remain the same so what is it that this is trying to say basically what we are coming up with i mean if you read the paper uh, you know uh, going to go through that what you will see is that he is seeing a situation where two bytes to be read from memory right and they go through some computation right so this pe is basically a processing element okay and what we are trying to do is we basically retrieve two bytes of data from the memory do some computation with it and return it back to memory right so it could be as simple as something like uh, a of i equals a of i into 5 Right, you basically pull out a of i, an array uh, value from the memory, multiply it by a constant, and then write it back into maybe the same location or somewhere else. Okay. Now, what this means is because you are reading two bytes, and reading each byte basically takes hundred nanoseconds at a ten megabyte per second uh, rate. It means that you can do five million operations per second. Right. Now, the diagram below that essentially says. Read two bytes, and then go compute, 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 right? And then finally return to memory. Okay. Now, what does this compute, compute mean? It basically means that you have some kind of hardware, uh, hardware. Some, you know, maybe one is a multiplication, then there is an addition, then there is something else. I don't know, a modulus, uh, maybe a square root, whatever. It doesn't really matter what you are doing with it. the point is for every piece of data that you pull out of main memory you do multiple computations before you return it to memory okay and by doing this essentially what they are saying is you know this what we have done by having this pbb structure over here is creating an array structure 
right? So this array structure that we have over here means that there are multiple computational units which are just basically passing the data one to the other. Each one does some computation, sends the data on directly to the next computational unit without going back to memory. Okay, which means that now for every two bytes of data that are read from memory, you are effectively doing six computations, right? And potentially, if all six of these things are being kept busy at the same time, right? In other words, on every clock cycle, I read one byte of data. I do some computation in the first PE, then pass it on to the second PE, but at the same time, the first PE gets the new set of data. Okay, which means that both PE1 and PE2 are operational. They are working on some computation. They pass on the information and therefore peak rate has now gone up by a factor of six, right? The number of computations now becomes 30 million operations per second. Okay. Now, why is this, why is all of this important and why is this useful? A big part of why, you know, this kind of analysis is useful is something called the processor memory gap, okay? Now, that was not the original reason why systolic arrays were brought in, but increasingly nowadays, part of the reason why people talk about systolic arrays is this processor memory gap, right? And if you want to understand what it is, this is a chart from uh, an article by uh, David Patterson's group. Uh, essentially, they proposed this thing called intelligent RAM or IRAM, right? This was in 1997. It was not something that really caught on, but you can see reflections of this today in what is known as in-memory computing. Okay, so intelligent RAM, as it was called in 1997, is now making a resurgence in the form of in-memory computing in some ways. Okay, so what is the idea of intelligent RAM? Basically, the observation at that time was DRAM has high bandwidth, right? But at the same time, the rate at which DRAM bandwidth has grown is lower than the rate at which processor performance has grown. Okay, and of course the question was, you know, how do you define processor performance? For the purposes of this chart, it is purely processor frequency, operating frequency, right? Now, what you would realize is that if I extrapolate this further, right, I end up with multi-core systems, right? Because frequency tapers off, right? But DRAM continues sort of along this trend this gap continues to exist. What is this gap? Essentially what we are saying is how much has the throughput of DRAM increased in a given amount of time versus how much has the computing capability increased in the same time. Okay. So what does that mean? It effectively tells you that if I have to go and keep pulling data out of DRAM for every kind of computation that I'm trying to do, right? My processor is basically going to be stopped. I'm not going to be able to do anything particularly useful, right? Because I'll be spending all my time waiting for memory, right? And the processor, which has, you know, been designed by Intel at some great uh, technology and, you know, has like some uh, three gigahertz operating speed is simply ending up waiting for data to come back from memory most of the time. Okay. How does a systolic array help with that? This structure, right? Essentially, it's precisely the, trying to solve a very similar problem. What it's saying is every time you get data out of memory, do multiple things with it before you send it back right to memory so in other words if you can keep your data in the registers of the processor right or in some kind of a local uh, computation and just pass it on from one functional unit to another and do a lot of computations on it before you return it back to memory that means that you can really get you can put the entire processing capabilities of the processor to use okay this is sometimes nowadays also referred to by this term computational intensity, right? And for those of you who are looking at hardware implementations, especially for something like neural networks and so on, this term compute intensity is something that you are probably going to uh, encounter in multiple places, right? Compute intensity, computational intensity, arithmetic intensity, all of those are terms that are cropping up more and more often in papers nowadays, right? This is a I mean, at least to me, this is a somewhat new term. The older term used to be basically the bytes per flop. Okay, Bytes per flop basically says that how many bytes am I transferring per operation or floating point operation that I'm performing. Okay, Or you could call it flops per byte if you want to say that, you know, I'm, I want to do multiple operations for each byte that is transferred. Okay, And the basic idea, of course, is RAM is slower than the CPU. 
once the data is inside the CPU, do as much as you can with it before you return it to memory. Now, hopefully, right, most of you have already been asking, I have at least internally thought of the question, how is this different from pipelining? The bottom line is it is not. Okay, so the, uh, this is very much using the idea of pipelining, right? Uh, one thing, of course, that, you know, uh, you will probably, by looking at this graph, you would think of it and say, look, I mean, you know, clearly I can't just pipeline because this is a cyclic graph, right? There, are, there is a cycle over there, okay? So clearly it is not as simple as just applying the principles of pipelining, saying, you know, find a cut set, put registers over here, put delay elements over there and so on, right? Here, in order to do this successfully, I clearly need to know a little bit more about the kind of computations that are happening inside the processor, right? So at a core level, what is being done is very similar to the idea of pipelining, but the fact that it can be done requires some deeper knowledge of the actual application that is being executed over here, right? I can't just blindly take an application, right? And say, okay, you know, that's it. Put a line over here, put some uh, delay elements over here, um, it's pipelined and now this is a systolic array, right? It's not as simple as that. I need to basically look at the functionality itself and see whether or not I can actually come up with this structure, which basically puts it into an array kind of a pattern, okay? Now, um, yeah. One of the important thing, the other important thing that we need to keep in mind over here and the reason why it's called a systolic array, right? Uh, so, you know, let's look at the terminology. Why is systolic? Right, systolic, uh, you have probably heard the term systole and diastole in the context of you know, probably blood pressure measurements or something like that, right? But basically while talking about heartbeat, right? And that is precisely the reason why this thing is called a systolic array, right? It's the way the data is pumped through the system, right? So data basically goes like this, okay? From one processor to another. And we can think of it as pumping data through the array, right? And this sort of reminded the original authors of how a heartbeat works, right? You basically take the, every time the heart beats, it pushes the data through the entire system. One more processing element, right? The, each heartbeat basically pushes the blood by a certain amount of uh, uh, through some quantity and then you know every time it keeps on doing that and it circulates through the system now of course every clock system ultimately works that way right i mean at the end of the day the fact that you have a clock in a digital system just simply means that it is going to behave like this so in that sense it is not really you know that only systolic areas have this business of pumping data through every time that you have a clock and a register that's you know that's how the register behaves right it takes its input and whenever the clockage happens it copies it through to the output the difference over here is in the regularity of the structure, right? There is a very, it's a, it's a constant sort of operation, right? I mean, all the processing elements have the same behavior day in, day out. They're going to keep on doing the same thing. Right? That is the sense in which this pretty much is looking like a heartbeat. There is no sort of conditional operation somewhere based on which some processing elements may be clock gated or turned off or not enabled, something of that sort. We are essentially looking at a situation where most of the time at least, the array is just performing the same kind of function again and again, okay? Now, which means that ideally we would like these processing elements to be identical or as close to identical as possible, okay? The reason I'm saying as close to identical as possible is, I mean, even here you can sort of see that probably the first and the last processing elements have a slightly different behavior, right? They're getting their data from memory or giving their data back to memory as opposed to another processing element. So clearly even here there will be boundary conditions, there will be some differences between the different processing elements. On the other hand, you can even have, you know, slightly more diverse kind of structures where there is considerable difference between the processing elements. But for the most part, what we are looking for is some regularity, right? Part of the reason we are so interested in this whole business of regularity is simply this notion that, you know, how does a layout of a structure like this happen, okay? So what we would end up with is if you have a very straightforward structure like this, 
then it means that each of these processing elements, right? I mean, you can basically come up with a placed and routed structure over here and just have a set of wires, right? So this could be placed and routed independently, right? Each of these and just have like short connections between the different blocks. Now, since we are talking about pipelining, it means that, you know, the terms that we use in the context of pipelining obviously have relevance here. The latency would be the full end to end delay passing through all the compute units. Whereas the initiation interval essentially says, you know, as soon as one processing element has completed, right? So we have something like this. If I have a structure of this sort, each of these is a processing element, then the latency would be the entire delay from here to here, whereas this would be the initiation interval. Right? Assuming that all PEs are identical or uniform. Right? So that the delay through one is basically equivalent to the delay through the others. Right? So as soon as the data passes out of the first module, it can accept new inputs. Right? A new iteration is initiated. So while the second processing element is working on the first data, the first processing element is working on the second data and so on. Okay? So that's the idea of, I mean, both of these concepts are the same as what we generally think of. 